Welcome back to Reviews with Elaine, because I have opinions. And today's opinions will be about Making Money by Terry Pratchett. Okay, uh, let's do this. So, I will admit, I have a pounding headache and had a hell of a stressful night. I had a guest pass out on my tour tonight. Uh, but this is a good book, so let's see if I can formulate some thoughts about it. Uh, Making Money is a Discworld book, and specifically it's one of the Ankh Morpork books, and super specifically it's one of the later Ankh Morpork books. Uh, we follow Moist Von Lipwig, who, spoilers for go uh, for Going Postal, if you have not read that book yet, that's the first Moist Von Lipwig book, and uh, the things you need to know from that book is he was hung as a criminal under the name of Albert Spangler and was given a second chance by the patrician veterinary, veterinary, I've always said it veterinary and I know that's not actually how you say his name, but uh, he was give, he gave him a second chance uh, to start a new life and the only requirement was that he makes the Ankh Morpork post office into a viable running unit. and. Turns out, yeah, Moist did a great job, and as a reward for doing such a good job and going postal, he is given the chance to do the same thing with the Royal Bank and Mint. Now, Moist is not exceptionally keen on the idea. He feels like he's really settled down and is, like, living, you know, his best life in the post office. Uh, but events sort of force him into a corner, and his smart mouth and creative thinking soon has him revitalizing the entire economic system of Ankh Morpork. All while dealing with assassins, a very odd dog, his own past, a head cashier with a mysterious past, a girlfriend who is determined to rescue golems and whose determination to rescue golems could uh, bring hell on the city, and the old money crowd who are desperate not to give up their hold on that same old money. Uh, uh, and gold. Or a lack thereof gold. A lot of the problem of the book is the lack thereof gold. Uh, so, thoughts. Uh, I was a bit nervous when I started reading this one because uh, somehow surprising me, one of the major themes of this book is the absurdity of the more abstract elements of how money works. This is a book that is very much about economic theories. And I'll be honest here, I've never taken a single economics class in my life. Uh, I know pretty much nothing about that kind of shit. Like, yeah, I know that money is a useful fiction, not any kind of reality. I know that we uh, used to run on a gold standard and we stopped doing that. Uh, largely, I think, because the economy got too big, maybe? I, I know that The Wizard of Oz, the book at least, is a parable about the gold standard, but none of this is going to help me understand complex economic theory. But the thing is, I should not have been worried about that from the beginning. This is a Terry Pratchett book. He is a master of making things understandable and humorous in that understandability. Of course a story is told in such a way that's going to help me not just understand the economic theory I need to understand the story of the book, but also to just understand more about economic theory. Like, even though I still know good and damn well I could not survive an actual conversation with an economist, I feel like after having read this book I understand more the nuances of how money as a system works. Uh, and I'm sure there are a lot of economic jokes in this book that I just didn't get. But unlike with uh, the Australian one, which I can't remember the name of right now, one of my problems with that one is I could tell that there were jokes coming that I wasn't getting and I, they were just sliding past me and I'm like, I don't get that because I don't know as much about Australia. Whereas in this book, I didn't even notice the jokes sliding past me. I'm assuming some of them were there just because I know Terry Pratchett tends to write complex jokes that really only make sense if you know a lot about that topic. and. I didn't see a lot of them in here, so I'm assuming that they were just so cleverly put in there that they're the kind of jokes that if you don't get them, you don't notice. And to me, that is a brilliant thing to do, because it makes the book enjoyable both for experts and laymen like me. I love the way the themes of economic value interacts with the themes of uh, personal value and like what is uh, valuable to a person, what traits are valuable, what makes a person valuable, like all the stuff with Bent like freaking out because if gold doesn't have value, does anything have value? It's very interesting the way that it plays along with the economic questions and like questions like is humor valuable? Is trust valuable? 
Uh, I feel like most Terry Pratchett books are very big on asking big questions, but not necessarily giving answers to those questions. Like they are designed to make you think about it without having the book itself give you a solid answer. And this one, I feel like it's actually pretty clear that trust in particular, and uh, the trust of others and the ability to inspire trust and like a powerful reputation is one of the most valuable things a person can actually have. And like, it's always been part of the world building that uh, veterinary uh, has so much power, basically because everyone believes he has that power. Like his power is built on his reputation, on people's fear for him, on their assumption that he can know everything. And it's been part of the world building since the character was introduced. But in this book, it becomes very clear that what we're talking about here is it is trust. Like, it is people's trust that Veterinary has the power to hold all this shit together. And, like, Moist in particular very clearly trusts Veterinary in this book. And uh, he trusts him to be the monster that he needs. And Moist himself is very clearly just, like, the only thing he brings to the table in any situation is the ability to get people to trust him no matter how stupid it is for them to trust him at that moment, and the willingness to use that trust to make big changes as quickly as possible. And then, of course, so much of this book is about what the monetary system of Ankh Morpork is based on, which once again comes down to trust. Gold is solid, it supposedly has worth, it's shiny, but objectively it only does have value because we trust it does. Like, Moist explains it very cl uh, clearly with the concept of a potato, and like the fact that when you're on a desert island that potato is worth a hell of a lot more than gold because you can't eat the gold. And uh, from the beginning it's clear that the banks run on not gold itself, but on people's trust in gold, and people's trust that the gold is there, and that they can access the gold if necessary, which is objectively, at least as I understand it, how a gold standard works in the real world too. But once again, not an economist, no idea what I'm talking about with that, uh, but it's just really interesting how the trust is played in on the personal level as well as a systemic level in this book. Uh, and then of course there's all the stuff about identity in this book and some of it is so fascinating. Uh, there's Owlswick and the Turnip, there's Igor and his Lisp, there's Moist and his gold suit, and there's something really magical going on specifically with the fact that Moist consistently thinks of himself as having a face that nobody can remember, that he is just a face in the crowd even when there's not a crowd. Uh, but in this book he gets in serious trouble because someone from like a decade ago remembers his smile, and he keeps going back to, no, I recognize that smile, that is the person I remember. And then there's, like, Malvolio Bent with his secret past, which is... I don't understand how that backstory actually made me cry a little, but it did, and it was so impressive, and it's a stupid little thing, but it's in a different typeface because we're in his memory, and he writes with a standard typeface, and it's the typeface that they reference him writing with, and it's just... it was beautifully done. But there's also Gladys. So Gladys is a golem. Uh, she has no genitalia. This is very clearly not directly stated because this is a Terry Pratchett book, but it's pretty clearly stated. Uh, she has no gender at all until one of the ladies at the, at the post office complain that a male golem is cleaning the ladies' room, so they put a dress on her. And that dress and the name Gladys imparts the gender of female on her and she starts identifying as a female and living as a woman and like in the beginning Moist treats this is very like heh 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 uh -huh. uh, he's having trouble with even thinking of her as a woman until he has that light bulb moment that there's no reason to think of the golems as male like they do not have gender. Gender is something that society has placed on top of them. And since neither, since they are not inherently male, there's no reason that they can't be female as well. And people are just assuming a gender for them. And he accepts Gladys has as much right to be a woman as to be any other gender. And then there's this revelation at the end that, uh, that golems, because they are made by placing orders in a clay form and then imparting it with like 
the spark of life or whatever, uh, by their nature, they take written word as sacrosanct. They presume the truth of any written word. And basically, for them, words are reality. And therefore, calling Gladys female made Gladys female. And there's something really interesting going on with all that. Uh, and my favorite thing about all this is Moist does not take advantage of this revelation that, like, you know, words control the golems in that way. No, what does he do? He tells Gladys, hey, make sure to read everything in the universe before you decide what's true. And that's a bit of a distraction because I was talking about identity. Uh, there's just a lot of really interesting things going on in this book with the way identity and the perception of identity works. Uh, and of course the most obvious is Cosmo Lavish trying to become veterinary by collecting his physical objects uh, and like walking a mile in his shoes literally. And of course his ending is chef's kiss perfect. I don't want to tell you what it is because it would ruin, you know, the joy of that moment. And I just love the fact that this book is asking us to evaluate how much of our identity is placed on us, how much do we personally choose to take, and how much is inherent to ourselves, and how much of it could be a turn up. Like there are so many really interesting things going on with identity here. But themes aside, I just really like this book. I don't think this book is as quotable or as laughed out loud funny as many of the Discworld books are. Like, I did not find myself constantly, like, taking photos of lines to share later. I did not find myself physically laughing as much. But, uh, some of the most hilarious jokes, as usual, are in the footnotes. And there just aren't as many footnotes in this one as there are in a lot of the others. Uh, but also, I will admit, one of the funniest elements of this book is this is the rare Terry Pratchett book that actually is broken into chapters. Most of them are not. And uh, each chapter has a list of things that are going to happen in it in a very, like, quick, shorthand kind of way. And some of them are absolutely hilarious, and some of them are, like, a little bit of, like, foreshadowing. But it's done in such a way that you're not going to be like, oh my god, it's been ruined for me. But like, it's things like the dark ring, an unusual chin, a job for life but not for long, getting started, fun with journalism, it's all about the city, a mile in his shoes, a lavish occasion. And some of the funniest moments were in those. But also I feel like there's a lot more character development here than most Pratchett books. Like, Pratchett books are books that I would not call character-driven at all. Like, we don't tend to focus on characters having big emotional arcs. Like, some of them do change, do develop, but that's not really what the focus is. Usually the conflict is an external one, uh, and like, like I said, some characters do have arcs. But this book in particular, I do feel like Moist did go through those big character arcs. Uh, uh, similarly, I've spoken in the past about the fact that I don't feel like Terry Pratchett's uh, romantic subplots are quite what most people look for in a romantic subplot. Like, these are not books that you're gonna sit there and squee about the characters falling in love. You don't get a big emotional thing. You don't get a lot of emotions from the characters in general. Like, the big emotions tend to focus on things like fear, excitement, and I don't mean like, ooh, excitement, I mean like, yay, I'm excited. And like, a lot of times when you see characters falling in love in Pratchett books, it amounts to two characters spending a good bit of time together, one noticing the other is the appropriate gender, maybe having one moment of shy blushing, and then congratulations, they're getting married. And like, yeah, we do have that relationship in this book too. There is a small romantic subplot that develops almost exactly like that, but Moist and Adora Bell actually seem to have real chemistry. They miss each other when they're apart. They actively want to spend time together. They show multiple different moments where they seem to be having, you know, uh, subtly written sexual feelings for each other. But also, they are jealous of other people. Uh, they actively try to have dates together. There's just a lot more human feeling in this relationship than you see in a lot of Terry Pratchett relationships. I also just, as a side note, absolutely loved seeing Vimes from the point of view of Moist, because I feel like both of these are characters that very much have a, a good bit of Terry Pratchett's heart in there. And part of it is a lot of uh, both Vimes and Moist are characters that bring in a lot of our world sentiment into Ankh Morpork. Like, they are the ones that have thoughts that seem to almost transmit from our reality to this reality. 
and seeing the two opposed to each other, because they are diametrically opposite people in many ways, but also very similar in other ways, and I just loved that. There's not much of the interaction, but what is here is absolutely beautiful. I also want to say that while I feel like this book did have a lot less of the silly, playful, jokey moments, it was one of the most cohesive stories I've read in any of the Discworld books. Like, a lot of the Discworld books sort of feel a bit like popcorn in that there's an event over here, an event over there, an event over there, an event over there, and because there's so many great little things, you don't always notice when some of them actually never come back. Some of them are just funny things that you see and then move on. And like, I feel like a lot of the books will have a lot of just random going on, and this one felt like a very well-plotted story. There's not much of anything extraneous in it. Uh, it's got a perfect climax for this book. Like, there's action, it's entertaining, it's fun climaxy stuff, but uh, there is a bit of a feeling of a runaway carriage to this climax, because things just keep happening and piling up on top of each other, and Moist is just having to deal with more and more stuff. But what I love here is that the action feels right for this book. Uh, so much of the action of this book is talking, it's figuring things out, it's coming up with new ideas, it's uh, developing plans, and it would have felt sort of wrong to have a literal carriage chase kind of ending where like a fight scene or a war or anything like that, and I definitely have read books like that where like the entire like story arc is built around people meeting and interacting and chatting and talking, and then the climax is a fight scene and it just feels out of place. But this book manages to have an ending that is both really surprisingly high in actual action, while also fitting the characters' themes and uh, vibes of this book, while also not feeling too talky. Because I have read plenty of books that, like, yeah, it's a talky kind of book, so it needs a t talky kind of ending, and then you're just like, oh my god, I just read, like, 500 pages of discussions. And no, that doesn't feel this way. But my favorite thing about specifically this book's ending is that it played with one of my favorite ideas in fiction. That uh, sometimes what trumps a well-laid plan is just someone who can play it by ear really fucking well. And like, Moist hasn't planned out any of the end. Like, there's a moment where he literally stops being able to plan entirely and is just like, okay, I guess I'm just trying shit from now on. And he's riding the wave and it all works. And yet, what I love about this, and sometimes in reality, playing it by ear is so much more effective than coming up with a complex, interesting plan. And there's a quote uh, about this on page 465. Mr. Lipwig had been in trouble, but it seemed to Igor that trouble hit Mr. Lipwig like a big wave hitting a flotilla of ducks. Afterwards, there was no wave, but there was still a lot of ducks. And that image is perfect because it's all this chaos being hit by trouble. And what saves it is the fact that it is just chaos. It does not matter if there's more chaos at the end because it was chaos to begin with. And uh, I love this in particular in comparison to like Cosmo, who's trying desperately to like plan everything ahead of time. And his determination to come up with these complex plans is what brings him down in the end. And I just love that in a book. And there's also something really interesting going on with the implication of wealth being based on uh, not the gold coin, but on the dexterity of the hand that holds the coin. Uh, the value is not in objects, but in the work put into them. And there's some really interesting things about society that are built on the work of, you know, golems, entities that do not choose to do this, and how Ankh Morpork doesn't want to be built on that, but in a way they're built on the remembrance of it, and how their monetary system ends up being based on, you know, uh, work not happening for free. And there's just something really complex and interesting going on in here about, like, the real world, how so much of wealth is built, built on slavery. Like, I feel like Terry Pratchett was definitely playing with some stuff there. And I don't think he ever, like, said anything super explicit in this book. Like, I cannot come out with one solid, like, statement of this is what he's saying with this. But it's clearly there, and it's wheedling its way into my mind, and I suspect in, like, two weeks I'm gonna have a revelation of what this all amounts to. But I'm back to economic theory accidentally. I, I, I did not mean to do that. 
Uh, I don't know, y'all. I, I still have a bit of a headache. I'm still having trouble focusing. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on this book, and they're not super coherent, and I can tell that this is going to be one of those books that I'll have super coherent thoughts right around the time that I've forgotten the actual storyline. Because, yeah, no idea why, but Terry Pratchett books, I just forget the storyline entirely. I'll remember themes. I'll remember quotes. I'll remember overall vibes. Stories? Nah, they disappear after a couple of weeks. Like, I've already lost a good portion of the story of uh, the Australia book. And I also cannot for the, the Lost lost Continent. That's it. I've already lost most of the story of that book, and I read it like three months ago. It's not that much. Uh, but mainly, I just liked this book a lot. I think it's a beautifully worked story that is fun, educational, deeply thoughtful, and littered with surprising ideas. Like, there's, I talked about the big themes in here, but there are so many moments of just random passing things that you're like, ooh, that's a revelation. That's something completely new. I've never thought about this this way. And Terry Pratchett is the master of just dropping those moments in a book that don't really have anything to do with the overarching theme of the book, but make you completely rethink reality itself. And it's just definitely worth a read. I think this is an absolutely brilliant book.